This bad boy is a universal low boy waffle iron, model E7124, that was manufactured by the Landers, Ferry and Clark Corporation of New Brighton, Connecticut. Universal was a brand name that Landers put on lots and lots of different appliances, stoves, irons, waffle irons and whatnot, uh, from 1900 till the, the mid uh, 20th century. Uh, the company itself existed from 1865 to 1965 when a series of stock shenanigans uh, broke the company and their assets were acquired by General Electric, which is a bit of an ignominious end for a company that survived two world wars and a Great Depression, but there you go. I'm having a little mm, confusion trying to set a date on this thing. William George's Waffle Iron book puts this in the late um, uh, 1930s. Uh, which confuses me because these handles are made out of wood and not the Bakelite I would expect from a mid-1930s model. Also, uh, this unit has the complicated and uh, expensive Landers heating system in here, which was very robust and nice, but was abandoned in the mid-1930s in favor of cheaper alternatives. And finally, if you look at these aluminum cooking grids, the top of each of these pillars has a small uh, dimple on the top of them, and that's not just decorative and low pressure casting used in the early uh, 20th century. These kept the sides of these pillars from becoming concave. So all these things would make me put it in the late 1920s. Uh, however, it does appear that the handle of this thermostat is uh, painted Catalan plastic. Uh, and that definitely puts it in the 1930s. So George is probably right. Uh, in fact, I kind of, uh, this sort of fell apart when I was aggressively cleaning it. Some of the plastic pieces fell out of the bottom. It's still on there really good because the, the screw post goes all the way through, but I wound up building up the plastic again with baking soda and crazy glue and painting it, and that worked really well. And if you've never seen that done, look on YouTube for baking soda and crazy glue, and you'll see lots of people fixing plastic um, that way. The thermostat makes this a higher end and a rarer model than its sibling, the E7104, which didn't have the indicator light or the thermostat. Uh, George, um, pegs the price of this in a 1938 catalog, the wholesale price, at $9.50, which is about $170 in today's money. So if you add a profit margin to that, you can see uh, that this was a pretty expensive appliance and, and why they were popular wedding gifts and not necessarily uh, impulse buys. This particular unit comes to me from my in-laws who wanted me to fix it. It's been in their uh, family because uh, the wires to the top heating grid had uh, broken, at least one of them had, and it came just covered in grease, screws missing, and this uh, hinge open because they had tried to um, fix it. And, um, and this front handle was missing, and it had mismatched feet, and it was covered with, with grease. And I, and I uh, didn't shoot any before video of it because I didn't think I was going to make a waffle iron restoration video because, honestly, the most of restoring a waffle iron is, is cleaning and cleaning and cleaning, and it's pretty boring. In fact, I think I've got maybe 30 hours of just cleaning on, on, on this one once it was, was disassembled. But now I've spent so much time on it and done so many experiments, I figured uh, I do actually have uh, some stuff I, I want to share with you. So uh, this is a very robust unit, and by all accounts, it's still a, a great performer. The uh, uh, robust uh, Landers heating element I talked about is actually this uh, coiled uh, nichrome wire that is snaked between these ceramic insulators, which are themselves anchored to the casting of the cooking grid on these little posts that were molded uh, in place. And then that's covered with a asbestos sheet and a, a steel uh, cap. Obviously, you want to be careful and make sure the asbestos doesn't get airborne if you're going to uh, play with this stuff. Of course, the, the whole thing, you know, it isn't grounded uh, and you can plug the cord in either way. So if any of the internal components fail and the chassis becomes live and you're grounded, this baby could kill you. But you know, that's a small price to pay for good waffles, isn't it? Uh, that said, I uh, probably would always want to run this thing on a GFCI or an isolation transformer just, just to be safe. Um, and uh, I would probably think twice before I let it run unattended uh, as well. It pulls about uh, 750 watts when it first turns on from the inrush current. And then as the, the coils heat up, 
it, it drops to about, you know, 680 watts. So it uses uh, quite a bit of juice and it heats up fairly quickly and it seems like it's going to work, you know, pretty well. Uh, so if you're going to restore one of these babies, you want to take it apart. And I mean everything so you can get to all of it and clean it. I took everything apart. The only thing I didn't do was drill out the rivets on these handles because I didn't want to make new ones. But uh, I did wind up drilling out the uh, thermostat anchor screw because it was seized. But eventually, you just want to take everything apart. Here's some video I shot while taking the bottom cover off to document the wiring when I was taking it apart. You can see all the grease. The existing 6 watt indicator light was burnt out and the E12 socket for it was shot. Uh, that arm coming in from the outside is the light, medium, dark thermostat control, which varies the throw of the bimetal strip that operates the contacts in the thermostat assembly. Uh, that is, for more heat, the bimetal strip has to get hotter and bend farther before it opens the contacts and shuts off the heat. And here's the underside with everything clean, a uh, new lamp and socket, and new wiring. The original wiring was asbestos cloth, which, of course, you should always dispose of properly, unless you're me and just put it in a Ziploc and threw it out with the trash. Uh, the replacement wire is modern 600 volt 20 gauge high temperature TGGT wire. TGGT stands for Teflon glass glass Teflon. And as you can see, the insulation is thinner. It's good up to 250 degrees Celsius or 482 Fahrenheit continuous service. And you can buy short hunks on the internet. The wiring looks complicated, but it actually isn't. Uh, one side of the incoming line is treated as a pseudo neutral and runs to the upper and lower cooking grids, which are wired together in parallel with a line running off to the indicator bulb. The hottish side goes directly to one of the contacts on the thermostat, and the other side of the thermostat switch goes to the cooking grids and the bulb. So running 120 volts of electricity into a chassis or into this cooking grid, this is one of the spares, um, and not having it touch the edges of the opening and electrify the whole bit of metal is a bit of an achievement. And to achieve that, the the designers used mica as an uh, insulator. They made mica washers and put stacks of them around each of these uh, terminals. And uh, on the back side here, there's kind of a mica gasket. And uh, mica is, is basically a sheet silicate. It's effectively a stone. And it's very thin, and it, and it makes these very uh, thin laminar um, uh, sheets. And so when you're handling this, I recommend peeling the whole stack off delicately as you can as one unit. Don't try to separate the pieces because they'll break. It's really fragile stuff. And then just take a little alcohol and wipe the outside off to get the surface grease off. Don't go crazy trying to clean it or you'll, you'll break it into tinier pieces. Here are some pieces that I broke before I, I figured this out. So I knew I needed a source of replacement parts for my unit, and I was fortunate enough when I looked on eBay that someone was selling the, the lower-end cousin of my model, the E70104, that doesn't have the, the thermostat. They wanted $12, I offered $10, they took it, and they charged me $25 to ship it, of course. Um, but she used a flat-rate box that was only $20 to, to get it to me, and she refunded me the $5 difference. And so who does that? I've never had that happen on eBay. So thank you, eBay seller. Uh, that was great. So uh, the, the re hard to get replacement parts wound up costing me $30, which I consider kind of a bargain. And as an aside now, I have kind of the, the leftover parts from, oh, oh well, <laughs> from, from her unit uh, uh, that I don't need. So if any of you are restoring one of these things and you can use these, why don't you shoot me a private uh, message and I'll uh, ship them to you for the cost of uh, postage. Anyway, Cleaning one of these things is a time-consuming and tedious process, as I've already uh, mentioned. Uh, these wood parts can be cleaned with uh, soap and water and uh, then painted with black flat enamel, which is what I've done. And I have a little jig, uh, an old board with paper clip wire sticking out of it to, to help me with that. So the uh, metal pieces of the chassis that are not aluminum can be hit with oven cleaner and, and left to sit overnight. I already did this one. I like to use this... Uh, uh, easy off heavy duty grill cleaner because it's particularly nasty and seems to work pretty well. But a thing I found that works even better than oven cleaner, especially if you have to get in a lot of nooks and crannies like on this hinge piece, is ammonia gas. So essentially you take the part, you put it in a Ziploc bag. If it's a really big part, like I put these whole rings in, 
Uh, you can put it in a small trash bag and tie it with a zip tie and put some ammonia in there and let it sit 24 hours. And the gas eats away the grease and by the time that's over, you take it out and rinse it and it pretty much falls off. Although with this uh, hinge, I did spend a fair amount of time with my trusty dental pick kind of picking out the, picking out the, little, the little pieces. But it gets it really clean and it'll go places that oven cleaner won't go. So the part of a waffle iron that's the biggest pain in the butt, as far as I'm concerned, to clean are these cast aluminum cooking grids, because aluminum is such a porous metal. And it's also unfortunate that they're visually so prominent, so it's important to do a nice job on them. Now these came uh, completely black because aluminum, like cast iron, develops a seasoning layer. And a lot of people tell you just, you know, leave that alone, uh, knock off any loose bits, or maybe take some baking soda and water paste and give it a little scrub and dry it and, and, and let it be, and that's fine. But I wanted to take uh, my plates back to a factory fresh condition because, uh, it, you know, it makes a better presentation. And a lot of the crud on, on my grids was over 80 years old and probably should be renewed, I, I'm thinking. So you got your chemical and mechanical methods. Chemically, uh, you're not really supposed to use oven cleaner on these because it actually melts aluminum. In real life, I found if this is totally covered with um, uh, oil, burnt oil uh, and junk, you can spray it on here, let it sit for 40 minutes and rinse it off. And it'll take the top layer off and not damage the, the, the metal too bad. Actually, this was my experimental one. And you can see, see how much darker the back of this one is compared to this one is. That's because this, this was hit with uh, uh, oven cleaner. So it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work that great. Um, uh, ammonia uh, also works and doesn't seem to uh, stain as much, but, uh, and also uh, the alkaline cleaners like uh, Super Clean, Simple Green, and Zep, uh, uh, they also work, but they tend to, they tend to seem to stain uh, a little bit. But the biggest problem with all the chemical cleaners, uh, to me, is that the results are uh, inconsistent, and you probably can't see it in this light, but this is really mottled and doesn't, doesn't look very good. So, Unfortunately, that takes you to mechanical methods. Now, you could use a wire brush, like on a Dremel or on a drill, and that does work, on, but you don't want to do that because it, it scrapes up the, the surface, and, and then waffles will stick to this. It won't, it won't take a new uh, seasoning uh, properly. Um, the other thing you can use is high heat, and you can use like a pencil butane torch to, to, to get this stuff to ashify and then knock it off, or throw these into a self-cleaning oven for uh, an hour. Now, uh, aluminum melts at like 660 degrees centigrade or 1200 Fahrenheit. So you wanna keep your cleaning temperature below that, you know, 800 degrees Fahrenheit and it, like a self-cleaning oven does. I didn't experiment with that uh, very much for, for two reasons. One is um, I was afraid, uh, I hadn't disassembled these terminals, which I later did and I was afraid uh, they would have been hurt. Uh, now that I know they're mica, they probably would have been fine. And then I didn't want this thing to warp in the high, high heat. And then when you get it out, you still got to like go into each and every one of these lousy little holes and, and clean them out. So that's a big pain and kind of a, a non-starter for me. Your mileage may vary. Certainly if you want to, give it a try. I did play with the butane torch and that looked like it was going to take forever. It kind of worked. But again, the results are just, just not sufficient. So ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that the best and to me the only way to really clean these and get them back to a factory fresh condition is to bead blast them with a rounded medium like glass or walnut shells or something of that, something very fine that'll leave a very smooth um, surface. And that's, 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 what I did, uh, that's what I did with this. I'm fortunate enough that I have a couple of friends here in town who have a shop with a blasting cabinet and it happened to be filled with fine glass medium media and they let me come down and blast away on my cooking grid uh, which was great and even at that it took 45 minutes uh, for each grid so I was there for an hour and a half blasting these away and even at the end of all that there's still some little black flecks here that are just there's just no way to remove them without causing further damage to the metal believe me I, I did try a little bit and made things worse I should have just left it when it came out of the blasting cabinet so really you know, run, do not pass go, do not collect $200, just, just go find a bead blaster and blast these things. If you use a fine medium, this comes out just fine and smooth, and I'm, it's actually nicer than it was uh, from a smoothness perspective, and I'm sure it's going to take a, um, a new seasoning very, very well, and of course it looks great. So 
Once all the pieces are clean, reassembling is mostly a pleasure, though I did keep discovering small parts I missed cleaning. It just seems like there's always something. I like to use a wire brush on a Dremel to polish screws and remove rust from the steel, and also probably to shoot uh, cadmium into my lungs. I don't know what these are really plated with, but <laughs> probably not the greatest. I also used a uh, Simichrome polish on a Dremel buffing wheel to shine up the outside and some Novus No. 2 plastic polish to get the scratches out of the jeweled red indicator lamp lens. And anyway, so that's it. Nothing to do now but uh, give this back to the in-laws and make some waffles. Thanks for watching.